Welcome back to our health and diving series. In this educational set, we will be looking at decompression sickness and how it affects divers, what it is and what divers need to be aware of. Let's look at decompression sickness as a hazard of gas uptake and elimination. It is one of the hazards associated with underwater diving and it is the controlled or uncontrolled release of gas from tissues during the surfacing or decompression process that may cause the problem. Now diving is a popular recreational pastime and it's an activity that many practical applications are related to, not only recreationally but also scientifically, commercially and even military. While diving can be done safely, and it is after all essential for all divers, no matter what the reason for the diving is, it's important to understand that the underwater environment can be unforgiving and problems may arise during a dive due to insufficient medical or physical fitness, improper use of equipment or inadequate management of high pressure environments and the release of that high pressure environment during decompression. And that is what we want to be talking about now. Decompression sickness, otherwise known as the bends. Now, there are many manifestations of decompression sickness, but in order to put these things together and to make any sense of it, we need to understand it a little bit better and understand some of the physiological mechanisms related to decompression sickness. When a diver is exposed to an environment of elevated pressure involving inert gases, mostly nitrogen, which means it's a gas that doesn't participate in the metabolism of the body, it can accumulate in tissues. That is the so-called absorption or uptake of gases. When a diver ascends at the end of a dive, the process reverses. And during this ascent, it must be controlled in such a way that the washout or elimination of accumulated gas occurs safely. And this can be achieved in various ways and there are various strategies. Sometimes it involves stops, sometimes it involves variable ascent rates. All of these produce or control the so-called tension or if you like the unnatural state of gas in the body and body tissues that when pressure changes may produce gas bubbles and the bubbles if they reach a critical volume may produce symptoms and that is what we're talking about here now the pressure at sea level one atmosphere or 14.7 psi one atmosphere is typically the pressure that dive tables work from each 10 meters increases the pressure with another atmosphere of pressure and under these conditions tissues gradually pick up additional inert gas until a state that they would be so-called saturated. There are minor variations in atmospheric pressures but these very rarely affect the significant uptake or release of gas. Diving at altitude, of course, is a completely different matter. And in that case, there may be specific recommendations and precautions that divers need to take to prevent decompression sickness. The pressure difference between the gas that's dissolved in the body and the pressure to which it is actually returning or being eliminated to is called the so-called gradient. Think of it as a concentration of gas and a concentration of gas flowing from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. 
with minor changes or corrections, then the body is able to manage that dynamic very easily. But if it exceeds a certain critical point, it may produce symptoms. Now let's look at pressure. What is pressure after all? Pressure is force expressed over or applied over a surface area. It's not only force, it's force over surface area. And this is the pressure or the mechanism, if you like, whereby gas is absorbed. We are, in a way, divers in an ocean of air. When we are simply living at sea level or we are simply walking around from day to day, going about our business, we're in a sense diving, but we're diving in air. That goes up to about 62 miles or 100 kilometers where we reach the edge of outer space. And in this continuum, which is fairly thin if you think about it, in this continuum, the pressure of gas increases all the way down to sea level. And then from there on, as I said, for every 10 meters, it increases by another atmosphere or 34 feet or if you like a little bit over 10 meters if it's fresh water. Now the variation may be modest when we travel in air but it is very very significant when we travel in water and that's what we need to understand. Under these circumstances there's gas exchange and the gas exchange occurs in the lungs because the lungs are essentially the connection point between the environment and our body. The way we absorb gas and the way gas ultimately is eliminated. The lungs, if you like, are the so-called barrier or buffer or contact zone where this gas exchange occurs. Now when pressure increases, the pressure of the gas that we breathe increases and therefore the gas that is introduced into the lungs and from there into tissues also increases. That continues up to a particular point that we call equilibrium and depending on different theorists that may range anywhere from 12 hours to more than 600 minutes. Then depending on how long we stay at that particular pressure, there's a certain amount of gas uptake and that increases the amount of gas we absorb. The deeper we dive, the faster the process occurs initially and then it plateaus up to a steady state point. Now what we want to do as divers and what we do do in order to prevent decompression illness is to try and predict the uptake and elimination of gas from different compartments. And there are various ways we do this. We do it mathematically using so-called half-time compartments, which basically means the period it takes for half of the initial or the additional gas pressure to be absorbed by the body. It's then stirred within the body and then by means of various computer so-called algorithms, we then try and predict how the gas is distributed through the body. We recognize that there are tissues in which these changes occur very quickly, such as in blood for instance, and there are tissues in which these occur very slowly. We tend to refer to these as compartments, but it's really an unnatural term. It's an artificial way of what we call modeling. In other words, making a complex physiological process simpler to understand. It remains though a mathematical construct. The fastest tissues of course are the lungs because they are instantly exposed to changes in the pressure of gas that we breathe. Blood follows and then the brain. The slowest being the ligaments and cartilage. 
the ability of gas uptake in tissues such as fat is relatively poor because it's poorly perfused and also fat isn't particularly important as far as body function goes and therefore the uptake of gas in fat is not necessarily important in and of itself. But gas tissues are lying next to each other and fatty tissues may lie adjacent to tissues that are very vulnerable to gas uptake. And all of these things need to be considered when we work with diving algorithms. So, let's just give an example. In a dive that is about five minutes. In those five minutes, a tissue compartment that has a half time of five minutes will be saturated or will be exposed to an increase in gas concentration of about 50 percent and with every additional five minutes half of the remaining absorption will take place in other words the steepest portion of the uptake is in the beginning the first five minute period and that's why fairly short dives often allow us to return to the surface virtually without thinking about stopping. But when we go deeper, when we dive longer, when we dive on different gases, then this process may be slower and it may change. And we need to now accommodate different tissues and their uptake rates. And this is called, as we get to know it, half times half times or tissue compartment half times. That is the process in which gas is taken up into theoretical tissue compartments. And we can invent as many tissue compartments as we like. And over the years, the past century or more, there have been different ways in which people have tried to model or predict the way in which gas is absorbed. And that is what decompression theory is all about. It's about this process of absorbing gas and ultimately eliminating gas. Now we work on six so-called half times for a complete absorption of gas. So if we have a five minute half time, it will take six times five minutes for the complete absorption of gas in that particular compartment to occur. The driving force being the pressure of the gas. Now in recreational diving we refer to this as so-called bounce diving. In other words we don't pretend to stay at depth so long that all the tissues absorb all the amount of gas that they possibly can. There are forms of diving in which this is done, but this is more in the commercial sector, which is then called saturation diving. With bounce diving, however, we need to keep track of different compartments of the body and the degree of saturation that occurs in each of these. Bubbles do not always cause problems, even when they do occur, but if the degree is higher or the supersaturation is greater, signs or symptoms of decompression sickness can occur. And by the way, we often tend to lump signs and symptoms together. The difference is technical in some respects in that a sign is something another person can see. A symptom is something that you complain of. But the signs are something that are objective. Someone limping, for instance, would be a sign. Someone complaining about not being able to stand would be a symptom. Now, it's important for us to understand that we cannot visualize bubbles in the bloodstream. We can use different indirect techniques so as to visualize them using Doppler, which is a way in which we actually use either sound, sound waves, to 
uh, measure the approaching or receding gas bubbles in blood vessels to predict so-called decompression stress and those may be used to determine the relative aggressiveness or amount of conservativeness of a particular dive profile. But the fact that there may be bubbles detectable in these mechanisms does not necessarily guarantee that decompression illness will occur or not. What we can say is that if no bubbles are visualized within the heart, the chances of bubbles are relatively low. And that is one of the ways in which dive tables have been developed. Now, we don't want divers to not believe that their tables or computers are helpful. Of course they are, and for the most divers. But we also want to tell you that your dive tables are not necessarily applicable to every diver on every dive. And therefore, we want you to know that in addition to taking care of yourself, maintaining hydration, and doing all the other safety practices, even divers that follow their dive tables may develop decompression illness. As we go through the following chapters, we'll be talking about different aspects of decompression illness and how to understand how this interacts with the body. Follow us with the next episode. In the meantime, join us on this channel, subscribe, follow us on Twitter, give us your comments. We welcome them and would be welcome uh, and would enjoy engaging with you in conversation. Until next time.